Okay, hello everybody. Hi there. So it's 1.40, we have a 30 minute panel here, which will take some uh, great effort and concentration to make sure we get some value out of this for everybody. So we're gonna go ahead and get started promptly. Uh, my name is Josh. Uh, thank you to each of our wonderful panelists here. We have Bjorn, Leslie, and Marcus. Every single one of them wrote a little essay for me uh, in preparation for this. So uh, before we begin, if we could just express gratitude for the work that they've done in preparing for this. Thank you. And are you, is there a mic over there? Should I? Because I want to make sure that our audio is captured for the video. All right. Let's project. Uh, so the discussion today is copyleft in a business context. That's pretty sweeping. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start by saying that none of us are attorneys. We are not your attorneys. And none of this is going to be legal advice. We're really going to explore the business side of things, not compliance or anything like that. But we may touch on those topics a bit. I would like to start by, by level setting a bit. Uh, people often conflate many different things when they think about copyleft or, or even open source. Uh, and Bjorn, I know you've got some thoughts there. Could you, could you share some of your thoughts to help us clarify our thinking? Then you can define different, combine different development models and also different um, business models with us. Of course, there are some business models which work best, better with some license models and development models which work better with certain license models, but it's always important to think clearly and to distinguish these parts. Any other comments? I thought that was very thorough. Did you um, maybe just one remark. Um, we found that um, if you choose to go down the copyleft path, then um, I think you should embrace it. Um, so um, when we started doing this, we tried to do GPL software, but make the customers think they buy licenses of the software. Um, this turned out to be a, a wrong path, so it doesn't really work. Um, and we, when we made the decision to really go open source, to really go GPL and copyleft, that um, made things very much clearer in the company as well as for the customers. I think most of the stuff I have to say is more relevant to later questions. Thank you. So I think we probably all know, at least intuitively, uh, that there are some proven business models in, uh, in businesses that have embraced copyleft, as well as some anti-patterns. Uh, Leslie, would you mind speaking to the anti-patterns that we've seen a little bit? Thank you so much, Josh. Um, so the, the greatest anti-pattern that I've observed uh, in terms of businesses' relationship with copyleft licensing is uh, folks seem to have acquired this notion that uh, copyleft licensing and the GPL are contrary and antithetical to doing business, to making a profit, to uh, building a sustainable enterprise. And uh, my employer, Red Hat, is absolutely proof that that is not true. Um, we have uh, been in business for 25 years making uh, software that is largely published under the GPL and then selling additional offerings around that software. So we're not actually charging anyone for, for the code specifically. Um, and I think the, the anti-pattern is the expectation that a business is going to be able to reap the great benefits of increased adoption due to freely available source code without uh, then needing to understand that with the uh, availability of source code comes the fact that there will be some people who will choose not to pay you for that source code and you need to have other ways to scale out your business and revenue model. Uh, and particularly in 
uh, VC funded companies, there's an expectation that you're going to have a 10x return within five years. And that's not a reasonable model if you're selling support and services around your core code base. And it's uh, support and services revenue is great, but it scales linearly with the next wonderful, talented person you can hire, whereas venture capital funded companies are looking for something that's going to uh, scale exponentially. So I think that the key anti-pattern is, you know, don't, don't expect to get the great benefits and virtue of everyone adopting your technology and it becoming the de facto standard while still expecting them to all uh, want to find some way to provide your company with revenue. Either awareness is a goal and has value, um, but I, I've seen a lot of uh, discontent with uh, people wanting it both ways, and it, it just leads to frustration for the community and the business. Actually, I don't have that much to add. I completely agree with you. I've, at Nextcloud, we follow a quite similar business model like Red Hat. And for us, it's, it's basically the same. Um, we really embrace our community and also the adoption from people who don't directly pay to us. Because for us, that grows the ecosystem that makes Nextcloud more popular, more widely known and used. And then the big enterprises who really need to have some guarantees, some support, some guaranteed SLAs and so on, they will come to us. So for us, it's growing the ecosystem and don't be afraid that people use your software because that's key to the success of your company. So we go um, away in between. Um, we don't. We sell services, of course, um, but we sell something like we call product subscription. So that is basically a maintenance contract for running our system in a specific instance, and that um, does not scale as well as a product, um, but it scales better than per hour um, services. Um, and um, since we do that, um, that was really a push for the company. Uh, I have to agree, though, um, we once tried to do a, a venture capital round, um, and it's really hard to actually make people understand you don't have the software as an asset, right? So they say, okay, and what happens when you sell the code? So I said, I can't sell the code. What? You can't sell the code. Okay. See you. <laughs> so um, we don't have venture capital, um, and we didn't pursue that anymore um, because it was too hard to make people understand from the finance world that we don't have this asset. So looking at the other side of that, so we, we've learned a little bit about the, some, some anti-patterns there as well as the, the patterns that we see in the, the, the companies that you yourselves are involved in. Uh, are there any other are there any other good examples of business models that uh, involve copyleft that you'd like to speak to? Yeah, I think it's it's not easy to find good a lot of good business models which um, work with copyleft. To be honest, I think there are a handful or two or three business models which we see was were quite successful. Um, I think um, the subscription uh, model, like you described, is um, is a quite successful model, um, selling support, customization, um, long term support, um, and so on, um, works quite well. But I also have to, of course, admit that. Um, this might be work good for some software kind of software, might be more challenging for other software. So it's not that easy that you can pick one um, business model and uh, expect that it will work for, for all um, kind of software, I, I'm afraid. Uh, thank you. I think I, I feel a little bit odd um, as an American talking about what I've observed in Germany around copyleft business models, but here I am doing it. Um, one thing that I think is is often lost in the discussion about copyleft in a business context because we tend to think of the large technology companies when we have these discussions. But uh, small, medium businesses that are focused on the process of supporting free software and or writing extensions to free software uh, that, that clients request are an incredible source of employment and value in Germany. Uh, any, I, I, I don't know, like 20 or 30 of my German buddies in, who are software developers are all working at small IT shops, five to six employees. They all earn an excellent livelihood. They're happy. They get to take a vacation every year and to someplace sunny, which if you live in Hamburg, you need eventually. Um, and, and they're all doing quite well. And none of them are, are working for publicly traded organizations. None of them is going to have a huge stock payout at some point. But they're providing real valuable services. And they're doing so within their local communities, right? They're supporting businesses that they can literally walk out their front door and go and visit the shop for whom they're you know, creating a point of sale back end, et cetera. And one of the, the things that I find 
really joyful about that is we're not only having the opportunity to create livelihoods for people who are in the software industry, but we're, we're doing so in a way that empowers their local community to be able to do their business better and again, once again, serve their local community. And that's always been a, a promise of free software that had me really excited about getting involved in it like 15 years ago. Um, maybe adding to that, um, when you are a open source software and a company and you are open with it, um, at least in Germany, that's what I know is that you automatically are considered to be on the good side. Um, so that's a huge plus if you look for developers, um, because a lot of developers start off in the open source world and you just um, give them money for what they want to do anyways. Um, so that is, um, that is something, even if you're a small company, um, that is on, on, on the plus side because you get developers that would normally not apply for a small company, but you give them the ethics maybe, um, or the, the, yeah, being on the good side of, uh, of coding. So recognizing that uh, a common mistake that we often see is people conflate, uh, well, maybe not so much in copyleft, but certainly in the broader world of open source, people conflating business models and open source. Let's get away from business models. Um, what's the, what, let's start with Bjorn. What do you see as the role of community in the copyleft projects that rest at the core of businesses like yours? For us, um, community is really important. Um, if you look at the Nextcloud company, we are at the moment 45 employees, which is quite nice after four years, but it's not incredibly huge. Um, but we have a community of thousands of contributors who develop a lot of apps. I think what's quite special at Nextcloud, we have even contributors who contribute to the homepage of our company. So even the homepage um, from us is op developed in the open, which I think nobody else does. So even our homepage is done by the community to partly at least. Um, so that's really key. And if I'm talking about community, I not only mean home user community, so people who do this in spare time, but for us also community includes our partners and customers. So if you have really a really copy left um, product which no additional vendor login and no additional bur um, burden to, to join the project, then this is all become also attractive for your customers and partners because you provide this level playing field so your partners are willing and your customers to also join the community. And so we also have customers and partners who develop additional Nextcloud apps, sending pull requests to us to improve the project. So um, c community is really important for us. Nextcloud wouldn't be where we are without a community. Um, so things are a little bit different for us. Um, we are not very well known, or we were not very, very well known, um, but we are attached to the Wikimedia ecosystem. Um, so uh, the, initially we expected a lot of community development to happen here. Um, we found that this doesn't take place for us, so we don't get big features, feature contributions. Um, but what we get is like internationalization. So um, our software is available in I don't know how many languages, which is pretty impressive. Um, and that's just because we are attached to the uh, translating community. Um, and also one of the huge benefits I see is, um, I always say since we go, since we went totally open source, I can sleep much better because when we do new releases, if something really happens, some ba something bad would happen, then I would know in like a day or two because a lot of people use it and we, give, we get the feedback. So when I then take the software to my customers, um, it's not that my customers are the testers because the software has been tested before. And that makes me feel much more easy um, than at times where we did not publish the software. Um, so I work at a company to, that uh, chooses to do all of its development upstream first, so within uh, the d different free software projects, and then that becomes uh, code that we productize in various ways. Um, so of course the, the community is very important for all of the reasons these gentlemen have mentioned and that, that we're all familiar with in terms of, you know, there's more auditability because there are more users, but we also, um, you know, depending on the project, have an incredibly vibrant community of folks who not only are excited to use um, upstreams like Fedora, but who are also passionate advocates for getting other people involved in free and open source software through their, their own introduction to, say, the Fedora project, which I think is, it's incredibly useful for a business to have that as part of its 
you know, marketing campaign because eventually at some point you're going to want to hire more employees and, and or your community of users will have folks who are employed by large organizations that may need to contract with a company. And if your company is producing beautiful free software that everyone can use and your, your new employees are excited about it, chances are they're going to recommend your company as the person to make a purchase from. So um, in addition to all of that great stuff like, like QA and artwork contributions and documentation and all of the other wonderful things that the community provides to us, they also provide us with very clear business opportunities when, when it comes up. So one of the things that, that I uh, asked each of our wonderful panelists in preparation for this is, what are, the, what are the salient points that they really want to make sure everybody leaves this room with? So I'm going to give each of you an opportunity to uh, pontificate a little bit here. Um, for me, one of the important points is what I mentioned at the beginning, actually, to think clearly about differentiating between your business model, your um, development model, and your license model. That's one important thing. And another thing, which I realized is really important, because before we started Nextcloud, um, I worked in a different company, which also used a lot of copyleft um, license stuff, but used this to the, um, build an open core business model. And this is really hard if you start going this road to then change it later because you have the, the wrong mindset, I would say, in, in all in, in your employees, in the customers, in the community, everywhere. And this change is really hard. So if you really want to start a business around a copyleft project, about a free software project, for me, I realize it's really important to do this right from the beginning. So um, to right from the beginning set the right rules, the right expectations, so that people have come to the company, they know what they are selling. For example, if they're in the sales department, customers know what they are getting, because changing this later is, is really hard. So it's really important if you think about maybe um, starting a business around a free software project to get all these um, things right, um, right from the beginning. Uh, thank you. I'd actually like to make a point that was made beautifully uh, by someone else at one of the many uh, events that happened around FOSDEM this week. Uh, so Mike Malinkovich, who is one of the directors for the Eclipse Foundation, was sitting on a panel talking about um, open source in the auto and manufacturing industries uh, on Friday of last week. And the point that he made was that in cases where we are creating software systems that very much involve public safety. So for example, software to run smart cars. Um, he made the point that we should be examining if the default for those should be legislated to be the GPL because that way we are always assured that whatever modifications are made to systems like these, that that code will be available and auditable by a trusted neutral third party. And I think that was a really brilliant point that he made. And in addition to that, I would like to encourage you know anyone in the room who's considering um, working in these areas or who may be watching the video, I, I think that Mike's very salient point is also very prescient. So if you're working in those areas and you need, would like to learn more about copyleft licensing because it may end up being a part of your future, one, I would say fear not. It's really nice here. And I would also say to um, there, there are a multitude of ways to, to learn more about copyleft licensing and how that can work effectively with your business. I'm sure any of the panelists here would be happy to talk to you. Come to Copyleft Conf next year. Um, and I would also like to say that as a private citizen, I'm incredibly supportive of this idea because I think that uh, without that audibility, people, because of inevitable pressures of life, take shortcuts, right? We have diesel gate here in Europe where Volkswagen had you know code that uh, caused sensors to give the wrong readings. I mean, that's okay. So that's one thing. But you know, it's it's a. I feel like it's a different situation when a car is deciding on the trolley problem, right? This way or or that. So thank you. Um, maybe one point I want to get across is um, consider think good about your relation to a community and don't be disappointed if there is not a big community right away. Um, I found that initially, so we, we put the code open source, we put it up, we published it, and then we kind of expected that after three weeks we have like 10 developers that say, hey, that's so great code and I want to contribute to it. Um, it actually didn't happen. We were somewhat disappointed by that. Um, and we tried to, we spent some effort to, to kind of enforce this. Um, 
Then we got um, contributions, but they did not fit the development model or the standard, the code standard we want to keep up. Um, so, um, and for me, the, the crucial point came when I realized that, hey, the community is out there and provides like different things. For example, um, uh, since we sit on MediaWiki, we need MediaWiki deprecates code. We need to keep up with that. So that is something where the community is really great um, and, and they do way, way better than we do um, in, in keeping up that with that speed. And um, we, once we realized that, we tried to focus on that parts of the community and, and foster this, these areas instead of trying to create a community out of nothing where there is no community. Um, and that um, proved to be more efficient um, than everything else. So, I mean, if you have a community, that's great. But if you don't have one, um, try to pick the easy, low-hanging fruits. It's easier. So I think there's uh, one of the, the challenges that we face broadly in uh, with, with, with copyleft in particular, um, but, but also, again, open source more generally, is there are um, there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt that has been sown about these things. Um, and I think one of the previous panels uh, from earlier today you know, rightly noted that you know, copyleft compliance is not actually that much more challenging than compliance with permissive licenses. It's, it's just compliance. Um, so with an eye on the fact that uh, there's a lot of FUD out there, I do want to honor the fact that there, are, there may be challenges uh, that, um, that come with uh, a, a business that is built around copyleft in particular. So, you know, a few of you in, in, in your, your uh, written responses noted some things that um, maybe keep you up at night or give you, give you some pause or things that you, you do worry about. Um, and I, I want to, you know, give, give each of you a moment to, to speak to that. Yeah, I think one thing which many of you are probably aware of is um, that we saw that um, with the rise of this big um, cloud platform providers, um, we saw that um, more and more people who maybe um, five years ago would still have run their own systems, their own services in their own um, company, now decide to run them on a, on a cloud infrastructure somewhere provided by, a, by some big service providers. And what we see there is that often they, uh, they don't need the typical subscription we are selling and they don't need our support because they have a huge development team, they have a huge support team, they often can do this by their own uh, at a similar quality. And so um, we saw that some projects started to change licenses, for example, to, to tackle this. And I think that's a, a big challenge because um, I don't believe in these license changes because what they are basically doing, they're trying to save free software by um, removing the freedom. So they're killing free software by trying to saving it. So I don't think that's the right way. Um, we need to find way, um, ways to um, keep up, um, keep the software free and still build our business models around it. And, and find it working somehow. I think that's quite challenging. Unfortunately, I don't have really an answer um, to do it. Um, I think one of the reasons is, um, I think some projects see this problem, have faced this problem more than others. I sometimes have a feeling that the projects which face the problem most are um, venture capital driven um, projects. So they were maybe, you could argue that they were set up right from the beginning in, in a wrong way, because venture capital, as I said before, said, was said before, are driven by um, maximizing the profit in a short term period of time. Maybe you would try to set up your company differently and f um, don't rely on this venture capital. Maybe the risks are not that high and you can afford to grow, grow slowly and, and to avoid these risks. But yeah, I think it's a tough challenge and I think we as a community need to find ways Ways, um, to, to tackle these issues without giving up the freedom of free software. Thank you. Um, I find myself being kept up a lot at night by something that is not specific to copyleft licensing, but very much tied into it, which is um, the last 10 to 15 years have created an expectation amongst users of technology that the technology that they are using is there for them to use at no cost. And it's simply that the costs are amortized somewhere else. You have sold your data, you have uh, sold your privacy, and, and it's it's uh, not even part of the transaction for you, right? Like I have never read an end user license agreement. You can mock me later. Um, 
And, and because we have created that expectation, both from a consumer products perspective, but, but it also through the use of free software to build anything from, from applications to entire internet infrastructures, we have uh, trained people out of the process of understanding how to value what it is that they're using. So I, I don't think copy left uh, code is, is unique in that, right? Like, okay, so the software is free, but we must fundamentally understand that someone wrote that software, that person has bills to pay, that person has food that they want to eat, and we, I think that the, the big threat that I perceive is that we have socially created this idea that we can have something for nothing. And I think that that, that is a, a huge threat to us building sustainable businesses, whether we're building proprietary software or not. Plus one to that. Um, uh, so one thing that keeps me up um, is the um, increased automation of stuff, which is a very good thing, I think, from a technical perspective. But it takes away one of the building blocks of the um, business models around open source. I mean, if um, Blue Spice was, takes about, I don't know, a skilled developer can do it in two hours to set it up on a production level, maybe four hours if you don't know what to do. With Docker, you just type in one um, uh, command and then you get a, um, uh, a machine that we stuffed, so um, uh, we, uh, we equipped it. Um, so it's, it's really easy to do um, the software on a production-like level. Um, and um, that kind of takes away one of the um, foundations of um, uh, of where we are still needed. So um, I have like the mixed feelings about this um, uh, this increased automation. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we have just three minutes left here. So what I want to do is uh, you know recognizing that the the folks in here this is a a, a self selected audience. Uh, of people who are either interested in copyleft or are themselves real advocates of copyleft. And uh, is there anything that you as panelists want us to leave this room thinking about uh, insofar as like how, how can we advance uh, copyleft adoption? Uh, how, can we, how can we be advocates for it? How can we make things easier for people to, to do that adoption? Mm, I, I think um, the, the, ch the, the, the best thing is to, to embrace um, copyleft, um, especially if you, if you do business in, in whatever area. Um, also, if you are in a company who doesn't do free software as the main business, don't be afraid of um, copyleft. Um, see the chance that this gives to you. Um, you can be part of a huge community and you benefit more than you have to, to give. So it's really a good idea to, to join the community and give back to the community. Don't be afraid of copyleft. It really can help you to, to run your business, no matter if you are a real, uh, complete free software business or if you just do it in, in some areas. So yes to all of that. Um, and then the other thing that I would say I think is particularly important for us as folks who'd like to see copyleft um, take more prominence in a software development context, business or otherwise, um, you know, there are some really great talking points on the Free Software Foundation's website. There are some really great talking points elsewhere that have been written by some of our, our foremost legal scholars, many of whom are directly upstairs, um, about what copyleft licensing is, its implications for software freedom, its implications for business. You know, take, take an hour to read through some of those treatises, pull out the high points, and just be ready to educate people about what copyleft is, what it is not, and why it's a safe place for them to make a bet in their business because the more people do that and the more it becomes normalized that copyleft is not this strange thing over here in the corner that we ought to avoid, I think the more businesses will see, you know, taking copyleft as part of their business model and running with it. Uh, from my experience, companies really like open source software, so when we are booked, they are happy, they know that this is open source. And um, I think we were thinking about um, fostering that feeling somehow by doing some kind of, I, I don't know, corporate greenwashing program, which, I don't know, give them a badge saying we use open source software, something like that. I think, you know, um, f um, nourishing that feeling of we're doing good things because we support open source software, that would be a cool thing. And uh, we could all contribute to that.
So that's the end of our time, but suffice it to say, this topic is broad and deep, so I invite you all to speak to our panelists after this. Um, let's give them, we, we don't have time for questions, unfortunately, but let's, uh, let's give them a warm round of applause, please.